Uh, greatly appreciated the sermonette. Uh, hopefully uh, it will go very well with the message that I'm going to uh, speak about today. Because one of the most encouraging truths that we in God's church find very dear to our hearts is that God has offered and He has chosen to make each of us a part of His spiritual body, which is His church, of which Jesus Christ Himself has been ordained as the head of that body. I want you to turn with me over to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Here in Ephesians chapter 1, let's see how Paul expressed the relationship that you and I have with Christ as part of His body. Ephesians chapter 1, and let's begin reading in verse 18. He says, "...the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, and what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints." That's in you and I, the ones who are part of the body of Christ. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe? So this is the power of Jesus Christ that He has directed toward those in the body. Continuing on here then, it says, "...according to the working of His mighty power, which He worked in Christ, when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age which is to come." And notice verse 22, "...and He put all things under His feet." and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. It is Jesus Christ as the head of this church. He is the one who takes the lead. He's the one who opens the way for those who will follow after him. Those who will be made alive by a resurrection. And it is the hope of that resurrection that you and I hold on to every day as we live out these physical lives we have been given. Now what I would like to do this afternoon is for us to consider the one who is the head, the, our leader, who says to us, for each of us to take up, as it says in the, in the uh, King James Version, take up the cross and follow me. What that means is that we must be willing to face persecutions. We must be willing to face troubles and distresses for His namesake. He wants to know if we're willing to do that. Christ has to know because nothing less than our eternal life is at stake. The question that we want to ask and answer today is this. How will God know how will He know that we can be entrusted with eternal life? Or as was brought out in the sermonette, how will He know that we're willing to do what it takes to gain that pearl of great price? Are we simply guaranteed eternal life just because we have been called? Because we have had revealed to us understanding of God's plan and purpose that so few right now on this earth understand? Do we have eternal life by the many workings of God that we may see extent in our own lives or in the church itself? Does the fact that Christ assures us in Matthew 28 that He is with us to the end and He is with us always, does that ensure that we will enter the kingdom of God? that we will be given eternal life. You know, Peter said in Acts 4 that salvation, receiving eternal life, comes by no other means than through Jesus Christ. So it's critical that Jesus Christ is actively working in our lives. Christ told His disciples just prior to His ascension back to His throne in heaven that He had been given all authority. Not just some, not just authority in certain areas. Christ had been given all authority in heaven and earth. It also says that He not only had been given all authority, 
but he had also been given all power. Hebrews 1 tells us that he upholds, Jesus Christ upholds all things by the word of his power. All things are sustained by his power. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul called Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So the power of God himself, the power and wisdom of God, we see extent in Jesus Christ. So here we have the one who tells us that he will dwell in us by his Holy Spirit, and that one has been given all power and all authority in heaven and in earth. This is the one that you and I have as the head, as the lead, as the one we are to follow. If you remember the incident when Christ was in a boat with his disciples and there was a great tempest had come upon the waters and the disciples all feared. They were afraid that they were about to perish. And I know in our own lives many times we maybe have felt that our boat was about to be capsized and we were going to be destroyed by the waves of distress. But in the, in the example there, Christ arose from the sleep that he had been in and he rebuked the winds and the sea and there was a great calm came upon the waters. It says his disciples marveled and they said, who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? They didn't fully grasp who Christ was at this time. Paul says in Colossians 2 verses 9 and 10, For in Him, in Jesus Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. And he says, You are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. Over in the book of Job, Elihu, one of Job's uh, uh, counterparts there, rightly proclaimed to Job that God was perfect in knowledge. So we know that nothing is beyond God knowing. Psalms 103 tells us that He is the one who forgives our iniquities and He is the one who heals our diseases. Yes, Jesus Christ has the power. Not only the power over all authority, but also the power over everything in His creation. He has the power to forgive sin, and He has the power and the authority over all our diseases and our sicknesses. So just how important is our relationship to Christ if we are going to be able to deemed worthy to receive eternal life? Now I could go on for a long time standing up here talking about the the, just the tremendous, awesome, unbelievable power that Jesus Christ has as a Son of God, as a member of the Godhead. But I think you get the point of what I've said so far. Now what I would like for us to do as we think about, as we consider the power, the authority, the wisdom that is Jesus Christ who says He will dwell in us, I'd like for you to turn over to the book of 1 John. With that in mind, let's go to the book of 1 John chapter 3. 1 John 3 beginning in verse 1. He says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. That's how God looks at us. We are His children. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know Him. The world doesn't recognize God's people as His children, but God does. Verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God. Just speaking of it as a fact, because it is truly a fact. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, when Jesus Christ returns, when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope, which we have, it says this hope in Him, we purify ourselves just as He is pure. 
What this is saying to me is that God has called us now as His children. And we are His children because His Son dwells in us. We do not yet have the same power, the same wisdom, the same authority that Jesus Christ and God the Father have. And we will never be equal to them in this sense. But when we are changed at His coming, when we are resurrected from this mortal existence, and we put on immortality, as we're familiar with in 1 Corinthians 15, it says we will be entrusted with enormous power that we cannot even imagine in this fleshly existence that we have today. It says in Philippians 3.21 that we no longer will be conformed to the earthly, weak flesh, but we will be conformed to Christ's glorious body, and we will be empowered with godly power and godly wisdom and godly authority. Now stop and think for a moment. If God desires to entrust us with such eternal power and authority... It stands to reason that he must first know that we are ready for such glorious transformation from flesh to spirit. How many of you would turn the keys to the car over to your teenage son or daughter without having first know that they can handle the car? I mean, a 2,000 pound piece of steel and whatever going down the road at 70 miles an hour. You wouldn't do that, would you? You have to know first that they can handle what you're about to give them. And God has to know the same thing about each of us. You know, on a number of occasions, Christ made it clear that His followers would face challenges, even persecutions and death, as many have. Most of us have been in God's church long enough to have lived through many challenges and through many tests, both in our personal lives and as a group, as a church. Now we've always tried to maintain a faith in the fact that God is in control and Christ, as head of the church, as head of the body, He knows what He's doing. And we find a lot of comfort in that, as we should. Because He chooses when and what He wants each individual and for the collective group to go through. Now sometimes you and I, because we are flesh, we are human, we are weak, sometimes we lose sight of that when these tests and these trials come upon us. We become emotionally and spiritually entangled with our own human reasoning and our own human will that seems to come to the forefront. What we often fail to do during such times of upheaval in our lives, whether personally or in the church, is to look at what is happening from God's point of view. Because God does know what is happening, and God has a purpose in all that takes place. When we allow ourselves to begin listening to our own thinking, to our own feelings and our own desires, at the expense of God's will, we find ourselves going down a path that can and will lead to destruction, a path that will lead us into sin. We can never let ourselves, as many as have done over the years, be, be led away by a man, and especially be led away by our own selves, by our own thinking, by our own reasoning, and our own understanding, rather than seeking out that pearl of great price, the will of God in our lives. We fail to remember that God always has a purpose for allowing things to happen, as they often do, because He is working out the spiritual salvation of each and every one of us. We have to remember that, especially during times of trial and upheaval. So again, where do we begin to gain a good understanding of how God will know if we 
can be entrusted with eternal life. How is God working this out in the lives of men? Well, we're going to go back to the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, to begin with. Here in Revelation, turn over to chapter 2. Some interesting scriptures here that I think reveal some of how God is working in our lives and in the lives of humanity. Revelation chapter 2, and let's begin reading in verse 18. It says, And to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things, says the Son of God, and notice, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Now that's a strange description of Jesus Christ. But what he is doing is describing himself as having eyes, of flame of, uh, eyes like a flame of fire which means that he can look with penetrating judgment into the affairs of man, into the very heart of every individual on the face of the earth. It also tells us here that his feet are like fine brass. What this does is assure us that what he says, what he has ordained, will be fulfilled. We don't need to doubt it. We don't need to question it. It will happen. Nothing can stop it. Dropping down here in verse 20. It says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. God is showing us that we have a choice in what we choose to do in all situations. If you stopped and analyzed everything that goes on in your life and in the lives of mankind in general, I think you could honestly say that in every situation you have a choice. It's always there. It may be tough, but you have a choice. Again, we can use our own human reasoning and desires at such times to convince ourselves that God's judgment is in agreement with ours. That usually isn't the case, is it? Not very often. We can choose to resist sin and its temptations, or we can choose to go the way of man, as exemplified here by Jezebel. Let me read another scripture to you. I don't want to leave here, but I want to read 1 John 2, 15 through 17, where the choice that we always have is made very clear. It says there in those two scriptures, or three scriptures, it says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. Choices. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world... Three categories, and you can take almost everything that you see going on in this world and you can fit it into one of these three categories. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. They're all there. It's amazing how you could shake things down to three, three, three components and cover everything. It says, These is not of the Father, but is of the world. And notice, And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. A choice. In everything, we have a choice. God allows us to make decisions, and He also allows us to live with the results of those decisions. And some of us have made some that weren't real good. And I'm speaking of yours truly about that, as I'm sure we all have. Verse 21, he says, And I gave her, speaking of Jezebel here, or mankind in general, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. God gives a person time to repent. He always does. He gives a person time to repent, which shows the great mercy that God has toward His creation. 
But at the same time, we see that he does not, he does execute judgment when repentance isn't found. He gives every individual will have time to repent. But there reaches a point when repentance isn't found. So we see that there is a time when, as he says in Genesis 6, my spirit will not strive with man forever. There will be a time when a person no longer can find repentance. That's a point in time none of us want to come to. And I, I know we want. We won't. Then in verse 23, we begin to see the why behind what God does, what He allows or permits to happen in our lives and in the lives of all of His creation. Verse 23 says, I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am He who searches the minds and the hearts and I will give to each one according to your works. What's He doing? God is testing He's trying the hearts and minds of individuals. That's what He is doing. He has to know what emotions, what feelings, what desires are driving the decisions that you and I make every single day of our lives. What is behind the decisions that we make? What makes a person say and do the things that they do? Sometimes we wonder ourselves why we say and do the things we do. And then it says, He will give to each one according to the works. According to their doings. may not be good English. But that's what He does. He gives us according to what we do in our lives. Romans 14.12 says that each of us will give account of ourselves to God. Nobody is going to miss out on this. Everyone, every human being that's ever lived and will live, will give account of themselves to God. We won't be able to stand before God and Jesus Christ at the time of judgment and try to lay the blame at somebody else's feet. Won't cut it with God at all. So God is watching. He's watching to see how we will respond in any given situation that comes upon us. And how He deals with us will depend on the decisions we make in those situations. It's not complicated. It's fairly simple. Psalms chapter 11 verse 4. Let's go back over to the book of Psalms. Chapter 11. Psalms 11 and verse 4. The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. Notice, His eyes behold, His eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire, and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be their portion, the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous, he loves righteousness, his countenance beholds the upright. Don't allow ourselves to be deceived. God's eyes see everything. He is watching what we do in all circumstances. God knows what's going on. Don't ever think that God's gone off somewhere and He's not paying attention because that is not true. God is always aware of everything that goes on in the realm of His creation, especially within His church. You know, we sometimes become so discouraged, so concerned about what we see happening that we forget that God knows. But what God is doing is testing our hearts and minds so He can know what we will do. There's never any doubt about what God's going to do. 
He never changes. But He's always testing to see what you and I are going to do. If He didn't let things play out to the end, He'd never know. And He wants to give to each of us according to our works, according to the decisions we make during such times. How else could He know? We're not robots. He hasn't programmed us to act in certain ways. We have choices. It's simple. It says that even Christ learned obedience by the things He suffered. Was He ever disobedient prior to coming to this earth? Absolutely not. But now He learned obedience while living in the flesh. He was tempted, as it says, in all things. But unlike you and I, those temptations didn't lead Him to sin as they often do us. So God allows testing. He allows challenges and persecutions. He allows even false doctrine and false leaders to enter into His church at times. And I think many of us have seen that. Notice 1 Corinthians 11. And again, sometimes we get all stirred up thinking that God's forgotten something, but He never forgets a thing. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 18. First Corinthians 11. Notice how Paul expressed to the Corinthian church. Now remember the Corinthian church, if you go back and read First and Second Corinthians, had a lot of problems, didn't they? And when we have problems in our church today, is that a surprise? Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be at all. Verse 18. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Now, what Paul is saying here is pretty eye-opening. Because God is saying, these things have to happen. Why do some have to be saying and doing wrong things at times? Well, we've already seen why. So they can be tested. So they can be shown to be approved by God. That's what Paul just said. These things are going to happen. We can't let them blow us away. They've always happened because God is testing. He's trying. He's trying the hearts and minds of individuals. If you read earlier in chapter 3 here of 1 Corinthians, Paul chastised them for lining up behind certain leaders in the congregation. And he makes it very clear that's a terrible thing to start, a road to start down. Psalms 146 tells us not to put our trust in any man. Why? Because all of man's plans, all of man's promises, all of his righteousness that he shows before others, it's all going to perish. It's not lasting. It won't last. Don't ever think that God isn't completely aware of what we human beings are doing. Remember, His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. That is why we have to make decisions. We are always facing choices. Some people will make correct decisions and choose the way of righteousness. Others simply won't do it. Some decisions can affect our eternal lives. So we need to know the foundation on which our choices are made. God tests the hearts and minds so He can give to each one of us according to our works. We're given opportunities to choose, to make decisions that fall in line with our spiritual head and leader, Jesus Christ. When we don't, there are consequences. And some consequences are irreversible. So we better know that we know what our decisions and choices are always founded on. So what exactly is God testing and how can He know that we will stand with Him for eternity? Let's go back to the book of Matthew, chapter 7. You've probably read these Scriptures many, many times. 
But let's look at them in light of what they mean to those of us who claim to be among the chosen. Matthew 7 and verse 21. What are we dealing with here? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. What we're dealing with here is receiving eternal life, entering the kingdom of heaven. Notice, just calling Him Lord, Lord does not get us into the kingdom. Apparently there are those who think that this will do it. But it doesn't. What will get us into the kingdom of God? What will, uh, will cause us to receive eternal life? Notice what it says here in verse or the latter part of verse 21. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Nothing less than doing the will of the Father will get us into the kingdom. What do you and I naturally want to do? Our own will. That's what we want to do. We might as well admit it. That's what we fight against and struggle against all the time. We want to do what we want to do. But as I said before, pursuing our own desires and feelings at the expense of God's will is a sure path to spiritual destruction. Remember what I read to you earlier in 1 John 2, the things of this world are not going to last. It's going to be gone. We cannot put our hopes and faith in anything in this physical life. Only that which is eternal will last. And what would that be? Well, let's read verse 22. He said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done wonders in your name? What time are we referring to here in this verse? What day is this? It's a day of judgment. It's a day of judgment when those who are ready will enter the kingdom of God. But notice what those who say, Lord, Lord, are giving as their qualifications for entering the kingdom. They said, look, we, cast out, we, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We did many wonders in your name. I see no work where Christ said, no, you didn't do those things. But Christ was not basing their entering the kingdom on these outward manifestations. It's much like the Pharisees were, who based their righteousness on their outward show of obedience to the law of God. Now no doubt these individuals were observing the Sabbath and the holy days. They were tithing. They were not eating unclean meats. They even understood God's plan of salvation. They had right knowledge and they fully expected to enter the kingdom. But what did Christ see that they refused to see in themselves? Verse 23, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What Christ wants to know is do you practice lawlessness? Or do you keep all of God's law and His teachings? So what law and what teachings is Christ referring to here? Well, if you want to know, go back to the previous three chapters. Chapters 5, 6, and 7. We call these section of the Scriptures the Sermon on the Mount. This is a huge part of the law of God. We know what they say. We have read these Scriptures many times in our lives. We've heard many sermons given on these Scriptures. But the question is, do you and I actually do them? How are we doing? Do you do it? Or is it just an outward show for others to see? God's testing us on these things. 
This is what we'll reveal to Him if we are going to choose His way for all eternity. Are we doing these laws now while we are in the flesh? If we're not doing them, not striving to do them, and none of us can do them perfectly, we understand that. But if we're not, we're simply practicing lawlessness. And Christ will say to us in that day, I never knew you. It's sobering. But it's also encouraging. Because God would not be telling us these things if we couldn't do it. We have the power living within us through Jesus Christ to do what God wants us to do. We can't doubt it. We can't do it ourselves. We fall flat on our faces. But through the power of Jesus Christ within us, it can be done. Notice how Jesus Christ finishes His instructions to us in the Sermon on the Mount. I think it makes it clear, He makes it clear that we must spend our lifetime learning to live by every word that He gives us in these three chapters. Verse 24, Therefore, therefore, you know what that means, therefore, since I have given all of this up to this point, He says, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. We have to hear his teachings and then we have to do his teachings. That is the rock. That is the foundation that we must be building our spiritual house upon. You and I are a spiritual house that we're building. Like any house, it has to be built on a foundation. What is the foundation that we are to be building our spiritual house on? 1 Corinthians 3 9 says, We are God's building. You didn't know you were a building, did you? You are. And you're a building that is being built on a foundation. We must be building our building on a sure foundation. That foundation is shown to be what? It says right there. It's hearing and doing the sayings of Jesus Christ. It says also in 1 Corinthians 3 that Jesus Christ is the foundation. But as described here in this parable, hearing and doing His sayings amount to the exact same thing. That foundation which we're building on must be rock solid. Because as it says in verse 25, the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house. And notice, it didn't fall. Why? Because it was founded on the rock. Our house must be built on the solid foundation, which is hearing and doing the words of Jesus Christ. Those are the only things that are going to stand for eternity. But it also shows we can be building a house all right, but we can be building our house on another foundation. Notice verse 26. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine, and we read God's Word, and we sit in services, and we listen to sermons and sermonettes, so we hear the words of God. But notice this group says, they hear these sayings of mine and does not do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it collapsed. And great was its fall. Here is a man who hears the sayings of Christ. Here are those who say, Lord, Lord, I have done all these things in your name. But the reality is, they weren't doing them. His house was built on a foundation also, but it was a foundation of hearing and not doing the sayings of Jesus Christ. God doesn't give us excuses 
for not doing what he says. Now we sometimes create our own excuses for not following the sayings of Jesus Christ, but God doesn't give us the excuse. Verse 27. Oh, I read that. The rains came. What he's telling us here, brethren, is that the storms of life, the trials, the tests, those things are going to come upon every one of us. It's inevitable. It's part of our human existence. The question is, during those times of storms in our lives, are we hearing and doing, or are we just hearing and not doing the sayings of Christ? Study chapters 5, 6, and 7. And begin to analyze yourself what, what is the foundation that you are building your house upon. Verse 28. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at His teachings. For He taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Remember, it is Jesus Christ who is the head. It is Jesus Christ who has been given all power and all authority. It is Jesus Christ, the one that we have to be doing what He tells us to do. We're going to have storms. We're going to have trials. We're going to have tests. Some of you may be enduring some pretty tough storms right now in your own lives. But we know that more storms are on the horizon. We're still living in the end of this age. Times are rough and they're going to get worse. We can't deny that. We don't stick our heads in the sand. We know the Word of God. And He lays out very clearly for us what's coming. But He also gives us what we need to sustain it and to survive it. The end of this age will bring on the ultimate storms of the tribulation and the day of the Lord. And they're much nearer today than they were when we first began building our house. We have all been hurt, discouraged, angered, disappointed, frustrated over the years by this, by that, by things in life, by things in the church. It's all part of our human experience. God says there must be factions among us. We experience all of these things. Why? Because we're flesh. Because we're human. But God is eternal. Is He able to intervene? Is He able to correct situations? Is He able to save? Is He able to lead people to repentance? Absolutely. No doubt about it. God's ways and God's truths have never been hidden from those who want to hear, from those who want to seek that pearl of great price, that great treasure that God is offering to us. But some may simply have lessons to learn. God is patient much more so than I am. He allows people to make decisions. He allows people to make wrong decisions. When in His infinite wisdom He deems it necessary to bring that individual into His kingdom. So how will God know if we can be entrusted with the absolutely enormous power and authority that He is offering to us for all eternity? simply by the choices and decisions we make now when the storms of life come upon us. Are we going to hear and do all of God's law? Or are we instead going to pursue our own feelings, our own preferences, our own desires at the expense of what God wills in our lives? God has to know that's why He tests us. That's why He tries us. It's only through the testing of our hearts and minds that God will know that we can be given eternal life. Let's hang in there together because together we can succeed.